Hello everyone, thank you for attending my presentation. Before I carry on, I'd like to go through some disclosures and disclaimer. I am the founder and CEO and shareholder of VLight, developer and manufacturer of photobiomodulation devices. Discussions involving parameters and their delivery need not be with a VLight device. This presentation is intended to educate only Discussions about scientific basis may need clinical investigations to validate. The content here is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician. Now, photobiomodulation may be new to many of you, uh, but you would have come across some devices that describe, you know, low-level laser therapy, low-level light therapy. It's been researched over 50 years. Uh, the FDA has approved um, devices for uh, aesthetics, hair growth, fat loss. So I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures. Here are some um, devices that are out there in the market. There are some that shine specifically on some location, uh, some for the faces, uh, some for pain relief. There is a casket-like device where you can lie in and, and seem to be quite popular among professional sportsmen to help them to recover. And then we have these devices for the head to help to do brain stimulation. A lot of that comes from our work. And the uh, here's an example of what the um, a brain stimulation device look like. Now, um, when we shine that on the head, we hope to achieve some measure of uh, penetration and a brain response. So it can be uh, pretty wide. This is a way to uh, kind of visualize what a treatment is going to look like. So on with the discussion of brain. As a group, we do a lot of research on brain stimulation and what the effects are. Now, the research on brain has been going on for quite a while, quite extensively published. Quite a number of parties around the world do that. They cover uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, we are in the midst of a clinical trial, which I will uh, speak on a little bit more. There's Parkinson's. A lot of this work is being done now in Australia. A traumatic brain injury. Uh, there is, uh, this is well researched. There's been a number of studies on animals and the effects on the cells and recovery and the kind of fact inflammatory, inflammatory factors that are involved. And we're also doing a clinical trial on the effects on traumatic brain injury. Very interesting, and I'll go to uh, more of this a bit later. Uh, there is the use for pain, for headaches, depression and anxiety, um, quite well researched. But not a lot of these actually have gone and moved on to huge human clinical trials. So we're involved in a few of these, I'll talk a bit more. But there's also, it's not all about medical. This uh, technology, if you can deliver light to the brain in the right manner, you can help with meditation and mindfulness. And this is an area we are researching. Uh, cognition and memory, maybe it helps your brain to think better, uh, better mental performance. Sports performance, you know, sports involves decision making, reaction time, there's a lot of brain. Um, stress reduction. So there's quite a lot of things you can do with brain uh, stimulation, but as I mentioned, we are in the midst of a large clinical trial. We are not the only party involved in this, but I'll say that uh, we are involved in probably the, the biggest pivotal trial. But how did we start? You know, we, uh, about 10 years ago, research has shown that when you deliver red and infrared light, to animals like rats, 
And uh, say these rats are transgenic, they are bred with biomarkers of these diseases. They actually find that the, uh, this kind of symptoms they're looking to reduce, like the beta amyloid plaques and tau actually get reduced and the behavior get better. So we moved on, uh, we started research on the effects on dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, it started with a single case that went back to maybe around 2011, 2012. Uh, 2014, we started on a number of subjects. And clinical trials was kind of new to us at the time. It was pretty difficult to do even a small study, but we managed to see the effect. After a couple of patients dropped out because they were on uh, you know, a sham device that didn't quite work, but we did collect information on five subjects. And very, very interesting. The data that we found using a measure called the MMSE, very commonly used for to measure uh, Alzheimer's disease, was quite significant. You know, for the first time, something like this showed an increase of two and a half points, 2.5 points on the MMSE scale, which is pretty significant because all the drugs up to that point in time have not shown anything. At best, something like Aricept showed uh, it could help with the slowing down of decline, you know, over six months. So that it's you know it's telling us we're in, into something really interesting here, and uh, we ought to do uh, go on and move on to um, you know something bigger. So that was a device our original device was pulsing at 10 hertz or the alpha. Now, a professor Linda Chow from University of California San Francisco thought this was very interesting, uh, you know, let me try and replicate it and see if I can achieve something similar. So I told Professor Chow, okay, um, we spoke about it, I would recommend that you go on to 40 hertz gamma because of what it has been showing in, uh, you know, in dementia patients, uh, in, in the work on memory and coding, uh, the kind of the, the kind of improvements they see in in um, in, in vitro studies and how you know the, the reduced there, there is reduction in toxicity. Then there were there was a very interesting and very good study that came out of MIT uh, that showed actually at that time we haven't actually seen that study, but that study came out of MIT showed that you. Uh, you know, animals that were subjected to pulsing at 40 hertz, exactly 40 hertz, had reduction in these biomarkers like, you know, the plugs in the brain. And I thought, you know, that was a validation of what we're trying to do. So back to what we recommended in 40 hertz based on studies on memory. So Professor Chow did a study uh, on uh, eight patients and randomized into half into sham and half into active. And she showed um, improvements in certain scores like ADAS cog, which is also common but a little bit more uh, accepted in the medical circles on improvements in cognition. So the group that were subjected to active photobiomodulation at 40 hertz improved quite significantly. But what was very interesting was, for the first time, the patients were also put into imaging, fMRI, which looked at the, the blood perfusion, and she did this over 12 weeks. Now, those who were in uh, the sham group or the usual care, showed, uh, you know, what you would expect in dementia patients, a decline. But those that were subject to the photobiomodulation group showed improvements, not just in behavior, but actually imaging as well on, you know, using fMRI. Now that is almost like saying that they have gone through a 
uh, control, you know, like a sh sham in a big study because you cannot fool imaging. There's no placebo involved. So that was a very important uh, milestone for us. Now we, uh, to get acceptance in the white field, in the scientific field, medical field, we really need to do a big study. So we um, got together with a team of consultants and ourselves and came up with uh, and had discussions with the FDA and Health Canada and we decided, okay, it's got to be a double-blind randomized study uh, with a sham device on 228 subjects. So this is going on. We have been, uh, we had to stop actually uh, the study for one and a half years because of the pandemic. So we are about to resume again. So we'll see what happens. It's promising, but you still got to do this big clinical trials. Then I mentioned that we are involved in a clinical trial for traumatic brain injury. And I want to share this um, story from a retired professional football player on the experience with um, injuries from, from, the, you know, from the sports and the kind of experience he has, you know, and then what happens when he went on to be treated with photobiomodulation. I love football. I always have loved football. I loved everything about it. Football was my identity. There was a lot of situations where I was aware that I was hurting myself. However, you just don't process it. You don't think about it. It doesn't create any change in your behavior whatsoever. And then there was, there was a building of anxiety that was um, more than just typical anxiety. It was more of a morbid anxiety, I guess you could say. Social anxiety, uh, these things started hitting in, the, in my mid-40s probably. It started to build to the point where it became very, almost debilitating at times, where it was affecting my relationship with my wife, it was affecting my job, it was affecting my ability to find peace at all. And it was after some real intense situations that I started to look at the possibility that it was related to football. I was able to convince him to go to the neurologist and to go through, it was like 10 hours of neurocognitive testing. And then the results were significant brain damage, most likely due to football. It was suggested that we go visit Dr. Nazer at the Boston VA because she was having success treating vets, Gulf War vets, with near-infrared light. So over the next few days we were tested, we qualified for it, MRIs were taken, and we started a six-week protocol where they would shine near-infrared light on my head for 20 minutes, three days a week. When we went over the testing, both the MRIs as well as an neurocognitive testing, there were significant improvements across the board. From my observations, he seemed so much better to me. So then when we went over the results of the testing, it confirmed um, what, I, what I had seen. The results indicated that the infrared light treatments improved my symptoms and my cognitive abilities. When I went off the light, they decreased again. When I went back on the light, it started to improve again. We had the final testing two days before we drove out of Boston, and the results of that testing were every bit as good as the in-hospital treatment. It verified that the home device, the V-Lite device, was just as effective. It's hard for me sometimes to express the depth of gratitude I feel for having our lives back. All I can say is that it has, it has made all the difference in my quality of life. It has caused me to see life different, look forward to moving forward. It's had a tremendous effect on me, emotionally, cognitively. I feel brighter, I feel like the fog is lifting, if not gone. And the great secondary effects of this is that my workouts have gotten incredibly better. So now we see uh, he's been working for to many brain injury, it has worked for dementia. Now, I've got to emphasize that these are specific case reports, you know, small studies. So to be able to make a claim that, you know, really helps with this uh, 
with a, a traumatic brain injury, particularly among athletes that have developed something called CTE. And CTE is what happens when you have repeated uh, blows and concussion to your brain. And over time, it slowly develops into dementia. You lose control of your brain, you can get violent, you, you, know, you, you are not able to control yourself, in addition to the loss of cognitive function and memory. So let's see what happens, because I think if we can uh, do something with this, it, sh it should be very helpful to a lot of people. But how does, how does all this um, able to happen? We are looking at different conditions, but it all comes down to something called the mitochondria. The mitochondria exists in all our cells, uh, except maybe the, uh, the red blood cells. And the liver cells, say, will have 1,000 to 2,000 mitochondria. These are little organelles in the cells. And a long nerve like, you know, uh, like the axons to the lower limbs, which could be a few meters, could have one to two million mitochondria. So they're very prominent. They provide structure to your cells. And what happens when you deliver light that reach the mitochondria? Some things happen. It goes into this... Um, respiratory chain or the electron transport chain and other than in this well-known discussion about improved blood circulation it also released some important molecules number one the it uh, reactive oxygen species is a free radical gets you know it it gets clogged up in the respiratory chain when it is not functioning properly it releases that, and it happens because the mitochondria has a receptor for light. Now, the other things that the mitochondria releases when it is not functioning properly or not optimal, subjected to light, are, are growth factors. The um, factors that control inflammation and a, a, a number of other things. So the other thing that it also releases is nitric oxide. Now nitric oxide is familiar to some of you because it helps to dilate blood vessels which helps to improve blood, blood circulation. So these are some of the things that are happening and it all centers down in the traditional discussion of photobiomodulation in an enzyme called the, the cytochrome C oxidase. This is an enzyme in the last terminal of the respiratory chain. It releases that, and it, you know, it's, it seems to accelerate this, this process. So it, is, so it is key. I won't go into the other the debate about, no, it's not so important. Maybe the viscosity of the water is more important than water structure. But we, we, go, if, we go from there. From the mitochondria, it importantly, it goes up to a higher level and affects tissues. And as far as the brain is concerned, it helps with something called synaptogenesis, which helps to, uh, you know, produce more synapses, which helps, which is involved in the uh, transmission uh, of signals in your brain. There is the um, production of new uh, blood vessels, angiogenesis. There is so that helps with the increase increase of blood blood flow. It's anti-inflammatory. That is important when it comes to diseases and number of things and keep you know even your brain healthy. It's anti-apoptosis, which helps to um, slow down the program death of cells. It increases uh, neuron progenitor cells, which are kind of stem cells that goes into the production of the neurons. And then it increases something called SOD, superoxide dismutase, which helps to neutralize free radicals. As you know, as you know, this is good if your free free radicals are, are too much. And then there are other uh, 
neurotrophins like BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factors, which helps with the growth of brain cells, and the glial cell derived neurotrophic factors, which the glial cells are all part of your uh, you know, the brain cells to keep it healthy and keep unwanted materials away, and, um, and, and nerve growth factors, the growth of nerve cells. And then there is um, the reduction of toxicity in your brain too. So it's not all about just blood circulation too. So I've talked about brain, what it does uh, for the brain. Well, photobiomodulation also works for the body, and that's the research that's going on. We're in the era of coronavirus, so it is something that we, we you know, I thought we really should talk about because as a team, we are also involved in the clinical trial to see if this technology can help someone to recover more quickly from COVID-19. There was a, there were some case studies done actually in hospital environment with, you know, photobiomodulation can come in big, um, big equipment that deliver more power, they use lasers, and going by the understanding that lasers can help with the recovery and growing of, you know, damaged cells, it is a good candidate. So I have a, a study that was actually published um, sometime last year among 10 patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19. In that uh, chart, you can see, you know, that compared to uh, sham, those that were, who were subjected to the photobiomodulation device actually improved. They improved in the pneumonia symptoms. These are all respiratory you know, related. The ability to breathe. So, um, you know, that is resp respiratory. And, and also the uh, reduction in edema in the lungs. You know, how your lungs are all clogged up. So that, those improved quite significantly over a few weeks. And then they looked at the response um, the responses from the patients versus normal care, it is pretty significant. I have an image here of the lungs. You can see the images of lungs that have recovered from this glass, glass, normal glass-like um, features in the COVID-19 patients to the lungs uh, clearing off. Now that is, uh, you know, specialized equipment using low-level lasers. But we want to make it more meaningful to people because when you have COVID-19, before you're hospitalized, you are trying to recover at home. And normally you don't want to be near a clinic and the clinic don't really want to see you or the hospitals don't really want to see you. So we have a device that we, were, uh, we had available for general wellness called the X+. Plus. This is a picture of it, and, and uh, we were kind of fortunate because this was actually um, good for a disease like COVID-19. Now, without going into a lot of details, it helps to treat the infection in, up, in the nose, nasal area, upper respiratory tract, as well as the lungs. That's why you have a module in the nose and a module over the chest, over the thymus gland, and also on the lung. This clinical trial has a protocol with an endpoint. The main endpoint is the time to recovery. It involves 280 patients. We have, at this time of recording, we have just finished um, the recruitment. The, the last subjects have done the, gone through the protocol. The data is being looked at in detail by professionals, and we hope for the you know the, the results to be fully out maybe by the time of this conference. So we'll see what happens. Now, 
we've been talking about light photons going to the body and there's something we need to understand about the photon it is i mean when we talk about energy energy medicine here we're talking about the photon as pure energy i'm not talking about subtle energy that many of you are familiar with, like in a chakra, in a prana, in chi, um, and vital energy. Here is a, it's a, a, an element in physics, which is pure, pure energy, and there is no mass. <laughs> there in the whole um, standard model of fundamental particles, only the photon and the gluon has no mass. Now the gluon is, is part of the uh, gauge bosons and the, and the gluons are actually in the, in the inside the atoms and holding, holding the strong, uh, strong structures together. But the photon works with everything else. Actually it's a very sociable um, element. It's, and although the electron is Another particle, uh, a fundamental particle, it has some mass. So they, they, but there's a lot of similarities, and I'm going to talk about what it can possibly do. So now we understand the photon is an elementary particle that can be used to work on the brain. Now we want to see what, what we can observe. There is the, um, what it does to brain signals. So we did um, some experiments on subjects in the early days, like in 2015. In real time, you put the device on top of electrodes, EEG electrodes, and you can see what happens in real time. Now this is very significant because we can now observe and measure changes in the brain by way of electrical signals. And you know what the photon that is delivered to photobiomodulation does to the brain. We are carrying on with these studies, um, and it is something that we do continuously because there's so much to be discovered. But we, <clears throat> we published a paper uh, not too long ago when we delivered 40 hertz to the brain and tried to understand on healthy brains what happens. Now this is interesting because it produced something quite unexpected. When we deliver 40 hertz, which is gamma, okay, you know, we kind of expected it to drag on and increase the power of the faster waves like alpha and beta. But what was unexpected was it was able to reduce the power of theta and delta, the, the slow waves. This is its uh, useful to, for neurofeedback practitioners, for example, who wants to, you know, say, addressing ADHD, uh, you know, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, where you want to, to have exactly the same thing. Now, we are planning to do trials. Um, ADHD, ADHD can be related to autism. But here is what we are able to observe in terms of s symptoms. We are also doing um, other with with um, other frequencies like alpha and see what the effects are. Now this one is not yet published, but what we have observed to date is it really does something similar too. But alpha seems to be more confined to the alpha waves. So um, this is interesting. Apart from that, the connectivity seems to improve, you know, globally on the whole brain. Now, we are learning here that it can be frequency specific. There is also other imaging being done using this uh, MRI scanners, looking at fMRI results. Here is a study that was published actually just last year by a group uh, in New York and also in, in Toronto looking at what happens when you put red, uh, red actually laser, low-level laser over your forehead and see what happens. 
it was very, very interesting too. You put in one spot and the whole brain responds. So you can see the network re responding. And what is also very significant to me is they, these neurons and the brain is responding without showing any thermal effect. That means the temperature has not increased. And it's not the heat that's causing all this, but purely the photons. And then, because it was being read in real time, the brain was responding within two minutes. And then when it, it's, they stopped, this was measured over 10 minutes when it stopped, you know, it kind of tapered off, but very, very, very slowly. So what we're seeing here is global effect, quick response, and no increase in temperature. We have uh, just witnessed the Olympics, and what I'm going to say is actually quite relevant. If you have watched the, the sprint events, the 100 meters particularly, or even the 200 meters, there were sprinters who were disqualified because they responded. They start off in less than 0.1 second, which is 100 milliseconds. So they're saying that if you, if you start off quicker in the response to the gun, uh, then, then one, one millisecond, you are, you know, you have, you've started too early, so you're, you're, you're disqualified. So that is a false start. And most athletes, sprinters, respond be between 140 to 150 milliseconds. And that's really, really fast too, if you think about it. Now what is important to understand is when, uh, this is in, in the textbook, it is understood that in, when you do this, uh, you know, the uh, uh, CLEM studies on neurons and so on, so how fast the the transmission happens, it is between 0 0.5 to 1 millisecond. And here, okay, 0 0.1, 1, 0 0.5, 1 millisecond, we're talking about 150 milliseconds to respond to a stimulus. But, but think about this. Our brain has 86 billion neurons, and each neuron has 1,000 connections. So you're talking about 86 trillion um, ha, you know, signaling in, in the brain when the whole brain is involved. But you know, anything you do actually involves most of the brain. Let's take, for example, the sprinter, is, you know, getting off the, the, the starting block in, in response to the gun. You heard it, hear this, it involves the ear processing, goes to the auditory cortex. Then it, it uh, you know, involves other parts of the brain like the like the thalamus, where you can control your, mus your muscle movement, go or no go instructions. It involves your decision making part of the brain. Is it, uh, is it a, real st a real gun going off or should I, you know, and I, I should control myself because if I do a false start, I'm going to be disqualified. And there are these stressful, uh, you know, the stress factor that involves in the emotional part, the amygdala, and then it sends signals to your muscles, instructions of brain going down to your muscles. And that's a lot, you know, that actually involves almost the whole brain. Actually, like I said, it, anything you do and this, you know, it's just not the leg muscles, you're talking about arm muscles and then the visual uh, part of it too. So think about it, when you, for 150 milliseconds and the uh, say the signal transmission normally is 0.5, it takes only 300 connections. But uh, here we are involved about in trillions of connections. So something else is, is happening. And, and I want to, uh, to, to think, you to think, to think further about this, and it could involve some elements of quantum mechanics. Is our brain like a quantum computer? Uh, it is, you know, is everything is computed and working very fast. Here is a picture of a quantum computer. There is like a chandelier looking thing. 
And why is, th is it that? Because they have to cool down the, com the computer to close to absolute zero as much as possible. And that is minus 273 degrees centigrade. And that's really, really hard to do, right? Um, so, okay, you do computing and that's what you try to do. You do this helium mix and, and so on. But the body is not like that, you know. The brain is warm, 37 degrees in normal, normal body temperature. So it's more than a quantum computing machine. There are some theories that, are, have, that come, can come out and, and um, the probably very prominent is the Nobel laureate Roger Penrose, who received his Nobel Prize last year working together with Stuart Hameroff, saying that, um, you know, it has, there has to be quantum mechanics in the brain. And they came out with this orchestrated objective reduction theory. The, re, the objective reduction is argued by, by um, Penrose is there because there's quantum gravity involved. There is, you know, the, um, uh, that has to happen for, to allow for consciousness. Then that you got to be orchestrated to bring stuff together. It's got to, to allow a, a, a conscious event to happen. And what is, is relevant here is, the, is that uh, when Roger Penrose came up with this theory, uh, Stuart Amarov, as, as an anesthesiologist, had his ideas that the microtubules are involved. And Penrose said, yeah, okay, it, has to involve, it has to involve symmetry and there's lattices that are present in the microtubules. So microtubules are everywhere. They, they are all in this wet and, and, and noisy and messy environment in our body that may allow and some isolation from the, uh, in the environment that, call, that this allow qu quantum mechanics to happen because at a temperature as you go higher than absolute zero, there is decoherence, interference in, introduced that make it very difficult to happen. But the argument is, you know, the microtubules are structured in such a way it allows it to happen. There are dipoles. Uh, dipoles are like you have positive and negative uh, uh, poles at both ends that allows the magnetic field to happen. And later on, Hammerov argued that um, we should also maybe look at the aromatic rings of these proteins, like tryptophan, for example, that allows this to happen. So there is a way to look at it, and we can draw parallels with photosynthesis, right? For photosynthesis to happen in the plant of bacteria that harness energy from the sun, convert it to, to say, ATP energy, it happens really, really quick. It is like, you know, one over like a hundred billion uh, a billion of a second or something like that. So it's really, really quick. So it's not possible based on the early understanding of how both the photosynthesis is happening, where uh, light goes on, you have this exciton, it's finding its path to the reaction center. It appears to have to happen uh, with the energy looking at all possible paths to the reaction center and, and have, take that path instantaneously, which is superposition, right? Now, uh, bacteria harness energy the same way um, as plants. So it's mainly plants and bacteria that harness energy from the sun to produce uh, energy. And think about this, mitochondria are actually bacteria-like organelles. You know, the bacteria and the mitochondria share a lot of the DNA. So bacteria has chromophores that receive the light and convert the energy. 
And this could be the reason why we are seeing the mitochondria having the light receptors to process the energy too. There's some work done. Uh, I collaborate with Jack Dijinsky, who is a professor of, of um, oncology and, and physics at the University of Alberta. So the mitochondria harness the light energy and produce biophotons. The biophotons theoretically are released to the microtubules. And this could be an elegant way to see how we are able to, to have such quick response in the brain because another quantum particle is kicked off and carrying on the signals and that is light energy. There are studies out there that's done. They have measured biophotons in your body. It, it wasn't that difficult because you have this uh, the photon counter, you can have these uh, special cameras that can, can look into this. But photons, these biophotons are released because there is a release in reactive oxygen species called the ROS. Uh, the, the ROS is, um, as you know, I pointed out earlier, actually is, are released by the mitochondria when they are subjected to, to light energy in photobiomodulation. So there, there are other uh, studies around um, the world, some published just a few years ago, showing that you can relate it to uh, light therapy or photobiomodulation. Now here's another way also to see how biophotons are carried and signaled and carried out throughout your, your brain. And there is a theoretical model that came out of um, University of Calgary, working with you know, University of Alberta, showing that the exons actually are like almost perfect structure to carry the biophotons, particularly in the wavelength of blue to near infrared light. So there's another way that is, is carried on too. So now we have a, another structure that is able to do this very quick uh, carrying of signals here at the speed of light. And, and, uh, and here, it may not involve superpositions, like I've mentioned before, but it could be involved in entanglement because the, pho the photons are traveling together in a channel. So that is another way to explain why the brain is responding so quickly. Now, as a team, we want to see what happens to microtubules because it's the, the, there's so much discussion about microtubules uh, being a factor in the, you know, the quantum processing of the brain. So when we did these in vit, uh, you know, the petri dish st uh, studies and exposed microtubules to near-infrared light, say pulsing at 10 hertz, the, mi the microtubules actually get polymerized. They kind of get together. We, have, we are doing more work. We find that it's also frequency dependent when we expose it to 1,000 hertz. It seems to disassemble the, the microtubules. And we are looking at other, f other factors that may be involved, like you know the exclusion zone of water and a number of things. So this is carried on because what we do here may be relevant in how we are going to I expose, say, uh, the brain to light at different frequencies at different power. Now we have covered consciousness um, roughly and the effect. Now think about it. We've talked, you know, in in the uh, quantum medicine world, we've talked about subtle energy and how it affects consciousness. But this is going to be interesting too when you have pure energy delivered to the brain at low power and see what happens among long-term meditators. Now of course we are more interested in meditation not just in health benefits and so there are many studies that show that meditators have increased gamma at rest compared to non-meditators. Not only that many meditations show high gamma activity in several areas of the cortex when the when the when the meditation is happening. 
And but this gamma activity is not limited to around 40 hertz. It's actually can be anywhere in the range of 40 to 200 hertz. So we wanted, we asked the question, what if we were to able to induce this kind of gamma activity in the brain somehow? Now I'm also a neurofeedback practitioner. I've been doing neurofeedback for many years. And basically we haven't done gamma neurofeedback even tried it recently. It's very difficult to do. Firstly, people didn't think about gamma till recently. Secondly, it's very difficult to do because that signal is hard to detect from the brain. It really attenuates through the brain and it's, uh, there's a lot of muscle artifact. You can't really do it properly. So then we thought, what if we were to use the V-Light helmet to induce high levels of high frequency gamma in the brain? Then what would happen? So, we had V-Light make an experimental unit for us that we could flash at any frequency we like. And so the first unit they gave us could go up to 200 hertz. And we started to experiment with this. And I tried it on myself. And it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. So, so I noticed that an immediate deepening of my PNSC state and an increase in sensory clarity, increase in joy, and increase in a deep calm. And this stayed for a long time. It's almost, for me, it's almost put me over the edge, caused some kind of permanent shift and deepening. So I was excited to have other people try it. So here we have Chula Dasa. So Jay referred to him as the author of The Mind Illuminated, the meditation teacher, trying it. And we had him we started low at a low frequency of stimulation around one hertz and went up slowly and had him uh, talk about his experience at various frequencies, especially at multiples of 40, such as 80 hertz, 120 hertz, 160 hertz, and 200 hertz. And he reported that uh, at 200 hertz, he, he felt that it helped him to have easy access to the highest levels in his system, which is level nine and 10, which Jay talked about. And and so he said, oh, that's interesting. We'll have other people try it. And other people started to report, other long-term meditators are the most people we've tried that with. And they report something similar. Here's Shinzen trying this recently. And Shinzen reported increased feelings of vibratory flow, uh, a deep calm, a no thought state, and then woke up having more energy to function. Now in, in the video clip that I've just shown you, the presenter, uh, Sanjay Manchanda, is actually, f I think, quite well known in the, uh, you know, in meditation circles and his research and interest in that particular field. He talked about uh, experiencing PNSC. Now, he didn't explain what PNSC was. PNSC is persistent, non-symbolic experience, which is another way of saying uh, enlightenment. What is interesting there is he, we gave him a device that was able to pulse up to 200 hertz. That was our first prototype. <clears throat> and while we used this device actually on a number of meditators already, people were switching onto a higher level of consciousness at somewhere at 40 hertz. In the beginning, we thought, hey, 40 hertz is doing it. You know, this is a, a frequency that uh, Stuart Hameroff found, a, you know, that was representative of a, and a, uh, what's happening in presenting consciousness in the microtubules. And then the long-term meditators were actually starting to switch at higher frequencies. And we had this device that was pulsing at 200 hertz and they were switching at this. So we needed to do, and we wanted to do it anyway, at, uh, allow higher frequencies to happen. So now we have like uh, the ability to pulse up to 10,000 hertz. We probably don't want people to go uh, too much higher than a few hundred hertz because we don't know what it's going to be like. But the point is, it seems that everyone, particularly long-term meditators, have a kind of switch. There was a study, and several studies actually, that show that 
long-term meditators, then long-term meditators have endogenous high frequency in the brain. And it seems like they have this presence of gamma in the brain uh, that allows them to switch to a higher level of consciousness or bliss or enlightenment, if you like. <clears throat> so um, that means that we are all different. And even meditators are obviously different. Those who have experienced psychedelics like ayahuasca um, would have had some kind of similar experience. So there's kind of a, there's something in the brain that's allowed this switching, which tells us that we really ought to study, you know, what this is doing. Delivering photons to the brain at certain frequencies and allowing it to switch onto some kind of altered state. We are going to start a study very soon. The main investigator is going to be Sanjay Manchanda, who you saw in the video clip. A lot of this is going to be done at Tucson, Arizona. And here is uh, details of the, the study. So if you uh, in that area in, uh, in Tucson, you know, try and sign up, contact uh, Sanjay and get involved in this study. I think it's very interesting. I think it's going to help people to understand meditation more. And also, it actually helps us to understand the brain better. So this is like a stepping stone to, to more things in the future. The device we used is called the NeuroPro. It is it should be available around around this time, but there is very very limited number available. You can actually adjust the frequency, the connections between different parts of your brain, the power, uh, different the locations, and there are modules to place on on certain parts of your body, and all this can be done on a on an app on the phone. So very, very, we try to make it very easy to use. So at the end of the day, perhaps there is, will be a community of people who are able to share the, their experience and different frequencies and how we can advance the whole field of meditation. So I want to summarize uh, what I have uh, presented to you. And, you know, we, we talked about um, the various medical conditions, uh, non-medical, like improving your brain and, you know, cognition, uh, meditation, and, and so on. It comes down to the, the key factor that is allowing this to happen, which is microtubules. And, it, and because microtubules uh, everywhere, it allows this this to be presented in the tissue level, but also very very interestingly, the way that the brain in itself is processing is very very quick, right? And that involves some quantum mechanics, but we are also suggesting that when you introduce additionally photons of certain parameters to the mitochondria, you are also kicking in this, um, you know, to, uh, to introduce, introduce some measure of uh, maybe control on how you can achieve the way the brain is able to, you know, to, to function and to get into this perhaps even a higher level of consciousness. So there is a, a lot of things that are in play. And as a group, we will continue um, more research into this area. Some new areas that we want to cover are also very, very interesting. In, and this is a term that is not familiar to many of you. It is called microstates in the brain. Um, even in neuroscience, it's not a very familiar thing. But the, you know, the brain actually presents microstates, and you can reduce it to what you call fractals. The microstate represents 
you take this EEG as a more section and it actually represents in a fractal form what's happening in the whole brain. Now we found that, and this is yet to be, to be published, that we can even influence microstates. And if you look at, and there was actually a very interesting paper uh, that is in discussion today, and that is also published very recently and saying that consciousness can be uh, represented in a big way and in, in a small, right down to, to uh, small elements that, um, that is, f uh, the word they use is fractal. So we are seeing this happening and perhaps one day we can actually go along this path and, ex and get to understand how consciousness is influenced because we can influence microstates. So I want to thank uh, you for um, attending and listening. And I couldn't do this alone. We have collaborators from all over the world. Some of them are actually top researchers, particularly in the, in the field of photobiomodulation, and also to, to my team. So I want to thank my staff. We have a disproportionately large numbers of PhDs and MDs in a company who are all passionate about trying to find out uh, what happens to the brain, to the body, when you deliver light in this manner. It's, it's very, very interesting. It is drug-free. Uh, it's is energy medicine. Uh, it has very little side effects, if anything at all. Um, some people feel it immediately, some don't, some, you know, but, but you can actually see and measure some of the mechanisms that are happening in your body. So, uh, so I look forward to be able to show more in the future, dig more into the theories, dig more into what is uh, relevant to people from, from different fields, anybody from just a lay person, I just want to improve my, my body, I want to perform better and be more healthy to those who really want to ex achieve extraordinary abilities and from our clinical trials to help with some of the difficult problems like what we're trying to do right now on Alzheimer's disease and some uh, researchers uh, working on Parkinson's disease. So, so we're busy. Thank you very much for listening and attending to this.